Hello, my name is Matthew Harper. I'm a sixth year PhD student at The Ohio State University. I'm working with uh, Professor Thomas Curler, and I'll talk about a generalization of the Alexander polynomial from higher rank quantum groups. Before I get started, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak and uh, for also inviting me to speak at the AMS section that was uh, canceled uh, this past April. So this talk is going to be an uh, extension of what I was planning to present there. Uh, and this work is based on uh, two pre preprints I have available on archive. So we get started. So first I'd like to motivate some of the work, uh, just some background, uh, then I'll go over some of the main results here and then just go through the procedure of uh, getting invariance from representations of ribbon Hopf algebras, and then re go through the construction of the Alexander polynomial from quantum SL2. I'll extend the construction to the SL3 case, although it uh, can be done more generally. Uh, I'll go through some properties of the, uh, these invariants and then compare it with some other some others, and then we'll have some time to look at the code and discuss some future work. So the main problem in quantum topology has been about giving interpretations of quantum invariance in terms of classical topology. And one of the examples of this is the Alexander polynomial, well-known classical invariant. And uh, in 92, Murakami, uh, reconstructed the Alexander polynomial using representations of unrolled restricted quantum SL2 and a fourth rune of unity. So uh, it's really the um, uh, Conway potential function and it recovers the multivariable Alexander polynomial, but for now we'll just say uh, it gives you the Alexander polynomial in the variable t squared, single variable. Okay, so what we're going to do is generalize the Alexander polynomial uh, from this uh, construction to higher rank quantum groups. So what happens when we do this? Well, what we get is for each semi-simple Lie algebra G, uh, we look at that quantum group and that gives us a uh, link invariant, I'll call it delta G, and it, it's a Laurent valued, Laurent polynomial valued invariant in the variables t1 to tn, where n is the rank of g. So some property of this invariant is that every Dinkin diagram automorphism uh, according, uh, corresponding to g gives you some symmetry of, of the polynomial. And you also have in these special types here that uh, this invariant is preserved under changing all of the variables to their negative inverse. So this is uh, some kind of anti-palindrome property. Uh, when you just think about the SL3 case, we can kind of specify uh, this a little bit more, say something a little more, that it's actually a of, uh, in the variables T1 squared and T2 squared, which means when we go to the minus inverse, it's actually just switching T1 and T2 to their inverses. And we also have the symmetry property that uh, we can exchange the roles of T1 and T2 without changing the polynomial invariant. This uh, invariant can also detect mutation. It assigns non-trivial not invariants to the Conway knot and the Kinoshita Tarasaka knot, as well as untwisted whitehead doubles. Uh, uh, another property here is that if we're looking at the invariant, the SL3 invariant of a knot, and we evaluate at one, or if we evaluate it where uh, the relation between the two variables is has product equal to plus or minus i, this recovers the SL2 invariant, which is the same thing as uh, the Alexander polynomial. So as we'll see, uh, this is not going to be uh, as straightforward as working out the SL2 case to prove SL2 invariant gives you the Alexander polynomial. And if we're looking at a multiple component link, uh, this sort of evaluation 
does not recover the Alexander polynomial of a multi-component link. And so just some background on, on computing the invariant. Suppose we have a, a ribbon hub algebra. Uh, so we're able to define these maps coming from the distinguished elements inside of the inside of the algebra. Uh, we take a representation and now we have these elementary diagrams. We associate those with uh, matrices in these specified on spaces. Uh, so if we have a closed, if we have a closed diagram, say we have a knot or a link, then we have a map from the ground field to itself. And say if we were computing the Jones polynomial, then we would have some Laurent polynomial in, in Q. But in this case here, where the representations that we're actually going to be considering, the invariant that we get is, if evaluating on a closed tangle, is the zero map. We, we get the zero invariant. So in order to resolve that, uh, we have to do the following. So for convenience, I'll assume that we're given a brave representative of the link. And what we do is we take closure over the right n minus one strands uh, of that braid representative. And what we're left with is a map from the representation V to itself. So effectively we're cutting, uh, another way to think of this is that we have our link and we cut one strand and what we're left with is a map from V to V. The uh, little box here is indicating that we're using this uh, modified evaluation map. Uh, and that's the, the map that we have here can be identified with this trace. So what we're computing here, we have uh, a cut trefoil. So I have an R cubed factor, that's this guy here. And now the HV, which referring to Otsuki's notation is the um, uh, pivotal element, uh, which I'm denoting by this black dot here, uh, tends to the identity, nothing's going on on this strand and we're taking the right uh, partial trace. Okay, so effectively some quantum trace on the right strand. All right, so this will give us some invariant. If our uh, representation V is simple, then we still get a scalar and this scalar happens to be a non-trivial invariant uh, independent of where we cut the link. So let's go through this thinking about the uh, quantum ethyl two representations. All right, so we're looking at uh, this unrolled restricted quantum SL2 at, so we'll take Q is equal to I and denote it by zeta here. So the unrolled piece just refers to that H is in here. The restricted part comes from, so first we have to be at a root of unity and then we impose this uh, nilpotent condition. So since we're at a fourth root of unity, the um, nilpotency that we're allowed to take is E square and F square are equal to zero. The other relations in black here are the standard quantum group relations. The H is only going to be useful for defining the braiding, so I won't focus too much on it. We think of H as uh, kind of some kind of a logarith logarithm of K. And of course we have K times K inverse is equal to one. And just some notation. So what's the representation? So what we do is we take the, the Borel subalgebra, so we'll just look at what's generated by E's and by K's, and we'll pick some T, a non-zero complex number. We can think of it as a, as a generic parameter or actually specify it explicitly. And now we act on a one-dimensional uh, vector space by these Borels where K acts by T and E acts trivially. And so to get a representation of the whole quantum group, we induce. So anything that's inside of B can pass through this tensor product and the Fs are just going to sit on the left. And what remains now is, well, we have a standard basis where either a one or a single F is present. So we're making use of the fact that F squared is equal to zero. So there's either an F or there's not an F. And in this standard basis, this is our uh, representation. So I've got the F indicated by this red, the E indicated by 
this orange. I'm just going to put this green double arrow in between because later on, when we move to higher rank, I'm only going to be putting uh, these double-sided arrows and not putting all of these individual F and E maps. So an important property here is that if T is equal to plus or minus one, then E, uh, the action of E becomes zero on the entire representation. And so we have a, V of T becomes reducible uh, with this being the sub-representation that dot on the right. And now I've modified this two-headed green arrow to the single-headed green arrow. Okay, so now looking at tensor product representations, we have the R matrix. So there's some uh, formula for the R matrix. I'm not writing that out, but acting on the tensor product, V of T, tensor V of T, this is what it looks like. And we're associating that to crossing like this. And so we get a representation of the braid group in this way. And now if we want to compute the Alexander polynomial, one way to go about computing it, we make use of this uh, generic tensor product decomposition, V of T tensor V of S is equal to plus the product of T and S and minus the product of T and S. Uh, this, this is a valid decomposition so long as S is not equal to plus or minus uh, T inverse. So, uh, for example, um, V of T tensor V of T dual is not, uh, does not admit this decomposition. So what happens from here? Well, we can think of that decomposition as some kind of nice change of basis for us so that the R matrix now acting on V of T tensor V of T breaks into V of T squared direct sum V of minus T squared. And so we have one block here, these minus t's, and then another block, t inverses. I'm just extracting the data here, so we can think of we're computing the minimal polynomial of R, or just computing the characteristic polynomial of this little two by two block and seeing that it satisfies this equation here. So we multiply this out, move things around a little bit, and divide by x, and we get this relation. If we translate this back into the relation of uh, the R matrix, this gives us uh, R minus R inverse is equal to this particular multiple of the identity. And this is exactly the conway skeen relation in the variable t to the one half squared. And so, of course, assuming the normalization that the R naught is one, this tells us that the SL2 invariant is equal to the Alexander polynomial in the variable t squared. So here's uh, what happens in SL2. Let's go to SL3. So again, we're looking at unrolled restricted quantum group and we're taking a fourth root of unity. So fourth root of unity just to, uh, so at least some aspects of why we pick this would be, so first of all, it's computationally simpler and uh, follows in line with Murakami's construction. Uh, and it's believed that representation theoretic aspects aren't too different if we look at this root of unity compared to say other roots of unity. So again, we're looking at the unrolled quantum group. So we've got the H here, and then the rest of our standard generators for I equals one and two. The relations are the same as they are in the higher rank quantum group, except for these uh, red relations, these restricted relations. So once again, we have, uh, both E1 and E2 squared, those are zero. And now these later relations come from the fact that the non-simple root E12 uh, comes from E1 and E2. So you have uh, the way that the E12, the non-simple uh, E in this, uh, also has the square equal to zero property, has to have the square zero property. And so, expressed in terms of E1 and E2 gives us this relation and similarly for the Fs. So of course we also have the relations for the Hs, again not too important for our discussion right now. And now we go to the construction of the representation, the higher rank representations. And just by analogy we take the Borels again, act by now instead of a single parameter we have one parameter for K1, one parameter for K2, these are non-zero complex numbers. 
k acts by the corresponding t, and each of the e's act by zero on this one-dimensional vector space. Again, we induce up, and now everything that's staying on the left side will be some combination of the f's, and the e's and the k's will pass through the tensor product and act on it on the v. Okay, so kind of the notation here is either one of the f alphas are there or they're not. So we have just some sort of indicator alpha one, alpha one, two, and alpha two. Uh, and we're mapping that to zero one, kind of just a switch. Is it on or is it off? And so what we have is an eight dimensional vector space. So this is just setting up some notation up for us. We get this eight dimensional vector space for V of T. And this is what it looks like. So here we have each of these green arrows is some E1 and F1 acting back and forth. The blue ones are the F1, uh, the F2 and E2 acting back and forth. We have this two-dimensional white space from F12 and F1 times F2 in the middle here. So this is indeed eight dimensional. And then all the way at the bottom, uh, we have all of, each of F1, F12, and F2. So similarly to the uh, rank one case, the SL2 case, we have if E1 square is equal to one, then the action of the E is vanishing here and down here. And if T2 squared is one, then we have the vanishing of E2 in these two positions. So we can just look at these a little bit differently. We have some sub-representation and quotient. See the structure a little bit better. The red stuff is the sub-representation that we get. These dotted arrows are the actions of F that vanish under the quotient. And then we have two four-dimensional uh, four dimensional representations sitting inside of V of T for these de degenerate parameters, T1 squared equals one, T2 squared equals one. Okay, but we also have this other type of degeneracy that it's kind of different from what happens in rank one, where the product of T1 and T2 is equal to plus or minus I. What happens is, suppose we start at the, the bottom vector and we apply E1 and E2, or we apply E2 and E1, uh, both of these land in the one dimensional subspace of the two dimensional weight space. And so, once we're down here in the red, we can't get out of the red. We are stuck in the sub-representation. Uh, and the complement here, the uh, everything else rather, uh, belongs to the quotient. So upstairs stuff. Okay, so we'll come back to those um, degenerates <laughs> in a little bit. So. Let's look at the representations V of T tensor V of S. Get an understanding of the R matrix. So I'll use this little sigma to denote the particular weight shift or think of what are the weights in V of one comma one. So this will be our index. Uh, so we'll, we'll use uh, the different f's as our index and then the sigmas give us the different signs that we get in the decomposition. So again this is uh, some kind of generic uh, tensor product and it generalizes what happens in the SL2 case. In the SL2 case we add one and minus one and now in the case that we're looking at here we have uh, we have eight uh, different signs and one of, there's a pair of uh, sides with the same weight. We have some multiplicity to some end in this decomposition. So we'll have the R matrix act on the tensor product V of T tensor V of T for some generic T's and that breaks the R matrix into blocks. And here's what it looks like. So we've got the multiplicity one guys. Those are all just some scalars and what happens on the the multiplicity two 
as some ends, is that they get exchanged under the R matrix action and multiplied by a factor of minus I. Uh, so if we looked at the characteristic polynomial of this little matrix, or the minimal polynomial of R, then what we're getting is a nine term skiing relation. So not really helpful in terms of computation like the Conway relation is, but it, you know, it's some relation. So a comment here is that the coefficient of you know, the C4 is uh, of all these negative crossings is the same as the positive crossing. So it's some kind of symmetric relation. Uh, but yeah, so definitely not as useful, but we can still do something with this type of idea see how if we know eight of the nine uh, of these invariants, then we automatically know the last one. And so we can apply the same idea looking at R squared, and this will give us a recursion relation for the tourist knots on two strands. So just take two strings, twist them up a bunch of times. If you know eight of the invariants, then you know the next one on your list, and you keep going up like that. So here's what the invariant looks like in its wholly non-simplified form. So not making use of any of the symmetries, just point out those symmetries to you. We have the, so kind of this first term is kind of T1 dominant, the second term is T2 dominant, where we just switch the roles of T1 and T2. And then this third term is kind of equal T1 and T2, it's completely symmetric. And now the observation here, you plug in T2 equals one or I T1 inverse. And this brings you to the Alexander polynomial of uh, two string torus knots. And more generally, if we have a knot and we make these evaluations, we recover the SL2 invariant. So again, not obvious because our matrix isn't satisfying the Conway relations, even if we did make the, subs the corresponding substitutions here, say two, two equals one. The off diagonal terms in the R matrix block decomposition is not going to satisfy the Conway relation. Uh, in fact, those are independent of T. So, and again, the, um, so this equality isn't true for multiple component links. Uh, it doesn't appear related to the Alexander polynomial under these substitutions. So kind of just a sketch, a quick go through of why this relation is true for knots. So recall that uh, if we suppose T2 is equal to one, then we have this reducible representation. So maybe just make this a little more explicit. So these two different uh, substitutions that we make correspond exactly with reducible representations V of T. So for example, this plug in T2 equals one here, we have a reducible representation. And I will denote the, um, the sub representation in red by X1 and the quotient representation in gray by X2. And now suppose we have our, we have our knot and we have uh, kind of two strings uh, in our diagram and they're both colored by V of T1. And now if this is a knot, we can think of inside of the tensor products here, we have X1 tensor X1, X2 tensor X2, and then the two types of cross terms between X1 and X2. Now, since we are working on a knot, we're only allowed to have the single coloring on the strands. And so we're only thinking of both X1 terms and both X2 terms. The cross terms aren't going to contribute to the, the trace that gives us the invariant. So it's enough now, just look at what's going on in X1, the, the knot colored by X1 and the knot colored by X2, the corresponding not invariants for those representations. So if we look at say some diagram colored by X1 and we have say A here is just any, uh, any diagram of a knot so that it's oriented both upwards 
uh, basically some map from x i squared to x i squared. And then we put the Conway relation right above that and we trace that off. We're going to get zero every time, independent of what our diagram A looks like. And so this is telling us that the invariant determined by the representation of SL3, this XI representation, is the same thing as the Alexander polynomial in the variable d to the fourth. So this is true on uh, knots and links. And now going back up to the top here, we have that the V of t representation uh, is equal to the Alexander polynomial on knots. So, okay. so let's go through some properties of the invariant. Uh, so done with the representation theory for now. So let's go through some results. So again, we've got the symmetry properties of the SL3 invariant, switch T1 and T2, and replace them with their inverses. This is invariant in squared variables. So given these symmetries, uh, it's enough to know the coefficients for degree of T1 non-negative and uh, degree of T2 coefficients you know, within uh, plus or minus the T1 coefficients. Effectively, what this is saying is if we know the invariant on a cone um, with the, the point, uh, corner point of the cone base, at zero. Uh, that tells us all the coefficients that we need to recover the entire invariant. So here's an example of that. So what I have in this box here is the constant term, the zero, zero term, and then uh, the rest of these non-zero coefficients inside of the cone. And if we expand it out, uh, this diagram, the full polynomial that we get, so the coefficient one is in position uh, two, two, corresponding to these squared variables. So we have t to the four, s to the four, t to the minus four, s to the minus one. Oh, so just, I'm using t and s here for better readability. And then the next one here is the minus. Now this is in position uh, four, two. So we have all the different four, two combinations and then so on. So, right, so in this position here on the one, one position, uh, we have t square, s square, t to the minus two, s to the minus two. So there's uh, only counting once. We're not making any kinds of double counts here. Okay, so that's how we recover the, the full polynomial from these diagrams. So we'll be just using these for the better readability. So, right, so SL3 invariant can distinguish mutation. And this is consistent with the result of Morton and Cromwell that uh, since our invariant is not multiplicity free, we look at the tensor product and deco decompose into some ends. We have that repeated sum end, and so we have the potential to, to, to distinguish mutants. And so these are the invariants for the Conway knot and Kinoshita Terasaka. And just so what's the mutation? Right, so just diagrammatically, we've picked four points in our diagram and then made. Uh, uh, just move that around and we get some different knot. So, yeah, so if you look at uh, at these and you make the substitutions, of course, both of these reduce to their Alexander polynomial, which is one. Uh, we also have this example for the um, untwisted whitehead double of the trefoil given here. So we have some kind of uh, clasp satellite and you put these extra twists in so that it's uh, there's no framing. And then, uh, so here's the invariant that we get. And uh, again, uh, untwisted whitehead doubles have Alexander polynomial one. This is giving us something else. And so of course we, we're detecting some something that Alexander polynomial is not. These dots with Alexander polynomial one have trivial Alexander modules. And so it's some kind of non-abelian invariant. So let's compare with some other uh, well-known non-polynomials. 
So let's start with a case where the Jones polynomial can distinguish a pair of knots, say 6, 1, and 9, 46. Uh, but the SL3 invariant uh, does not. They give us uh, these two invariants here. We've also got comparing SL3 with Humphly. So Humphly does not distinguish 5, 1 and 10, 1, 32, but here we have and distinguished by SL3. Another remark on this case is that these knots are fibered. Here's their Alexander polynomial. And so the coefficient with the observation here is that the coefficients in this rightmost column actually coincide with, uh, are, are enough to recover the Alexander polynomial on these. So I haven't been able to identify some kind of factorization property that 5.1 and 10.1.32 have, like the uh, fibered knots do, uh, the Alexander polynomial fibered knots have some factorization. It's not recovered that in terms of these higher rank invariants. Uh, another remark about uh, the fibered case is that from an SUN, Kasson invariants are completely determined by the Alexander polynomial and fibered knots. So, if I were so trying to uh, relate the SL3 invariant to some other known invariant, I would suggest that these are not going to be uh, one of the relations. Okay, one last example here we have the 8, 9, and 10, 155 knots. So another observation, again, we have this, this monic case. So it, it appears in this monic case uh, that the coefficients of the Alexander polynomial are appearing in the rightmost column. These are distinguished. Now the Jones polynomial does distinguish these, but the Alexander polynomial does not. Okay, so since we're in this medium, we have a little bit more freedom. So let's take a look at the code that I'm using to compute these invariants. So here we are. So I'm using Maple code to, uh, to work this out. This is just uh, what I came into working on this. So no particular reason for choosing Maple over something else. So what I've got, just, so there's some background code, I won't go through that, but we've got um, the representations here of all of the generators. So I do need some kind of representation of the H's, checking over the relations here, plugging everything into the R matrix and um, properly normalizing it to recover the unknot. Now, when I go to compute the invariance, I don't need the whole, uh, braid representative. I just need to know it's diagonal because I'm computing a quantum trace. And so I just have, I'm just computing that. So we go through, just have different examples here. Uh, and yeah, the kappa is just the pivotal element. So just plug in the different braid representations and it computes it. So I'm using not atlas to get some nice uh, braid presentations, I just plug them into here and it spits out the invariant. So when you get to bigger knots, like the, the mutant pair that we talked about before, uh, these have to be computed externally, uh, too much for my computer. So these knots with high um, braid index, so if they need four strings to, to compute the, the knot uh, in terms of a braid representation, uh, that, that means I'm working with an eight to the power four dimensional representation. These matrices are pretty big. So yeah, I have to work uh, externally to actually compute these, but it just spits out the, the whole polynomial here. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Okay, so yes. So I'll just end with some questions and future work. So I've defined the representations V of T for any G, not just SL2 and SL3, and the corresponding invariants have been defined. One of the main points here was that the SL2 invariant is kind of inside the SL3 invariant. And the question is whether if I have any uh, 
Leontreba G sitting inside of uh, another Leontreba, how are the how are the two um, delta G and delta G prime, how are they related? And so uh, the expectation is some sort of evaluation goes from the bigger one to the smaller one. Another question is, is there a way to reconstruct this by taking some kind of determinant or some modification of the determinant uh, in the same vein as the, the Borel representation? So finding some sort of space that the braid uh, that the braids act on that, that would recover the higher rank invariance. So that'd be interesting to find. Or possibly some relation to some other uh, geometrically constructed invariant. So for example, not floor homology or twisted Alexander polynomials. And uh, there's also the um, Constantino Gear Patro TQFT where they've used uh, representations V of T to recover the Breitermeister torsion. So the question is, if we use these higher rank, these higher rank ones, can we get some kind of generalization of Breitermeister torsion? And also, do we have a similar type of Turayev surgery formula for Breitermeister tor higher rank Breitermeister torsions? Okay, so thank you for watching. Uh, we've got a little overview of my slides here and maybe just sneak peek at some eye candy here. We have, um, this is the projective cover of the representation V of T where T1, T2 squared is equal to minus one. You can see here is the original representation and we've got stuff coming out the top. Uh, is actually two copies of V of T kind of glued together in a certain way with this 16 dimensional representation. Okay, so that's all I've got to say here. Thank you for watching.